Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guests this week are Emily Gagné and Danita Steinberg, a filmmaker and comedian, respectively, who hosted the podcast What About Meryl for two years and just launched their follow-up show, We Really Like Her, in which they discuss the women they love who make movies. The first two episodes premiered last week, and the third episode drops tomorrow, and you can find it wherever you found this show, probably. Emily and Danita picked Scream, the blockbuster horror movie that spawned a franchise, launched several careers, saved Wes Craven, and made slasher movies cool again. It's a near-perfect execution of what Roger Ebert called the dead teenager movie, with a charming, confident cast that includes Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, David Arquette, Skeet Ulrich, Rose McGowan, Matthew Lillard, and Jamie Kennedy, and it's also an ingenious commentary on that genre, with a screenplay by Kevin Williamson that turns the conventions inside out by letting the characters be aware of the rules of horror movies and making sure the killers know them, too. More than 20 years, three sequels, and dozens of pale imitations later, Scream still stands on top of the bloody pile, and with good reason. This is someone else's movie. Oh, well, we went through a lot of uh, deliberation because yeah. we're we're multifaceted ladies, <laughs> and uh, we um, I feel like we love really like feminine movies. And one of our other choices we thought about doing was Legally Blonde, which actually would have been very apropos right th- at this moment. Sure, but. We um, also love horror movies, and I think that that's sort of a part of our life that we, like, also want to share with the world, too, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I think I think it's funny because as similar as, like, our sensibilities are, they also, like, differ a lot. So I think we like a lot of the same movies, but what we love is, like, like polar, kind of on, like, polar opposite. Yeah. Opposites of the spectrum. So that's kind of, so that was kind of like a challenge for us to like figure out like a couple movies or like just this, or Scream, um, so that's a movie that we both like really love. Okay, and how did you come to it? Because you're not old enough to have seen it. (laughs) I mean, I'm old, I've seen them all theatrically, (laughs) but in 1996 you would not have been able to get a movie, so. Yeah, I mean, I was like seven when it came out. Uh, well, we're the same age, yeah. so yeah, we would have been seven when it came out, and I I don't totally remember exactly when I saw it, but I know I was too young to have been watching it, right? Because um, I always had kind of like because my mom's into horror movies, and I had like older cousins always hanging around the house who were into horror movies, so I was exposed to like everything way too young. Um, so I was probably like probably when it came out on video, so like a year or two two later, I probably like we rented it from Blockbuster and, and watched it. Yeah, I mean, I, of course, didn't see it in the theater either. But, yeah, I think it was a similar situation. I actually tried to remember the first time that I watched it. And I can't fully remember it. I'm sure it was in the basement of my parents' house. Sure. But I did see, I know what you did last summer, first, which was my first foray oh. into horror movies. It was okay. my first horror movie. And I was so scared by it, which is funny <laughs> on reflection, but I was so scared by it, I thought the hook guy was going to come get me. Um, but that sort of introduced me to horror and then I think I found out that Scream was another movie that was similar in a similar vein and I mean I was very excited because like Drew Barrymore was in it and I loved her my first favorite movie was E.T. so I've known Drew since basically since I was in the womb so um uh, so I was very excited to watch it and it became such a big part of my childhood Mm -hmm. like me too I feel like we watched it at so many like sleepovers or like you know with friends it was just that that movie that I think our generation like grew up watching and loving because it was like a scary movie but not really that scary so your friends that don't like horror movies could still watch it sure yeah uh, it's, it's the fun one right? yeah like, it's the one that's a party yes and that, which is which was its appeal in 1996 uh because there hadn't been a movie like that i mean there there are a couple of friday the 13th films that are self-reflexive and yeah. there's a party spirit to some of the 80s movies like house and fright night I mean, that was my adolescence. I came up through the 80s watching those movies in theaters with people, which was something like you cannot explain to people now. I can only imagine. People just, you know, like, I remember an audience for, uh, oh, the third Nightmare on Elm Street movie, Dream Warriors, and it played like a rock concert. People were yeah. so stoked for it. And when you step back a bit and say, well, this is a silly exploitation movie about a child murderer who somehow <laughs> caught on with teenagers... Okay, cool. Where do we go with this? And then the movie turns out to be good. Yeah. And it was rewarding. Or, you know, Hellraiser with an audience in 87. The 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 spirit of the films... I I, I mean, I obviously, 
uh, I love genre. I'm, I'm a long time horror nerd, but watching people embrace the older films now, what like all the Shout Factory, Scream Factory stuff that's coming out, realizing that this is the target market for collectors. I think, in a weird way, that wouldn't be happening without Scream in 96, which was simply, like, it was considered revelatory just because it had characters in it who knew about horror movies, right? I mean, there are other films that joke about them, but this was the first time that you had the screenwriter kind of depend on the audience being that smart and Mm -hmm. then the filmmaker executing it properly. Yeah, and the filmmaker that makes it is like a horror icon, which I yeah. think adds to the legitimacy of it, right? Well, he I, I should point out, he's a horror icon now. He was an I incredibly guess. disreputable horror icon before Scream. But he made A Nightmare on Elm Street. Sure, but he also made Deathly Blessing and you know, The Hills Have Eyes too. He made a lot yes. of really bad movies. Well, yeah, I mean, he started with like exploitation stuff. And then after, he made... Music of the Heart, which yeah, is like, my yeah. personal favorite. <laughs> okay, that uh, does bring us back to Meryl. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, I don't know, like, somebody that has experience in the genre, I feel like, made the movie. So I, I feel like he, he's, you know, speaking the language. Yeah. Oh, I think Craven was absolutely the right person for the job. Yeah. Right? But Kevin Williamson's script is just so, it's so smart. Yeah, it's and so... I just, I just have such an affinity for Kevin Williamson and everything he makes, like even like teaching Mrs. Tingle Mm -hmm. and Dawson's Creek and the faculty faculty, and I know what you did last summer. Like they're all just so good and cool and weird. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think he celebrates pop culture in a way that like you don't get like reflected at you very often, which I really appreciate. Um, I think like watching Scream, it's like, these are people that love movies, and so when I was watching when I was younger, it's like I could really just like identify as someone who also loved movies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was watching this again, I mean, I've seen this so many times. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, a million. Like Fifty times. Yeah. But watching it again, I was like looking at it really closely, and I was like, I am Randy. Like, I was like, <laughs> I hate to think that I am, but I'm Randy. Sure, yeah. Like when he's talking about Jamie Lee Curtis, I was just like, that's me. Yeah. Um. But. But, like, I love that you have that character that you can sort of, like, insert yourself For sure. into. You're just like, oh, you know, this person that knows all the rules yeah. of it. Um, yeah, like, we were probably, like, the movie nerds, like, of our friend groups. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and he's just, like, not cool and not having sex or doing anything yeah. interesting. And I was oh, like, yeah. that's me. Yeah. I just wanted to talk about horror movies and nobody cares. Yeah, I just went to, like, video <laughs> flicks every week in high school and rented <laughs> seven movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, a, that's what all I did. Yeah. And, so. and again, without, you know, that access, without that, that library, it is just another horror movie that people don't totally get. But yeah. It's, I think that's... Like, it came a couple of years after Clerks. It was right around the same time as Tarantino. The the, the genuine, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but the rubber band effect in the 90s where everything commented on everything else and depended on the commentary to really work. I think Scream is sort of the pinnacle of it. Or maybe Scream 2, where they expand the conversation yeah. with sequels. But it also works as a straight horror film that doesn't cheat and plays fair. And even, I mean, I remember seeing it theatrically the first time and kind of, the staging in that first attack on Sydney where someone... Well, I guess we can get into spoilers. It's a 20-year-old. <laughs> I'm always, I always hesitate with stuff that I really love because you don't want to spoil it for people. Yeah, but I'm absolutely. assuming if people are listening to this that they have a passing familiarity yeah. with at least the first one. Yeah. But that moment where Skeet Ulrich races back in, you're just like, he got there really fast. Mm-hmm. Well, I actually... I was like, how do people not think it's Billy? Like... Like, it's clearly Billy. But then <laughs> by the midpoint of the movie, you're like, it's not Billy. Like, yeah. you're convinced it's not, which is, like, the power, I guess, of the film and the screenwriting that you kind of get distracted. But it's, yeah. like, even Stu, like, at the beginning, Stu is like, oh, like, cut them from stem to sternum or something. And you're like, why is he, like, yeah. you, these guys are idiots. That's awfully vivid. Why would yeah. you, yeah, just casually drop that in conversation? You know? Um, but it's playing with the tropes, right? Like, yeah. it, you know, it, it knows we have seen all the other movies, or at least it's depending on us. Having seen, I guess, there were a bunch of whodunit kind of slasher films in the 80s that nobody really remembers. I, I vague, like, The Beast Must Die and stuff like that. Which, yeah. Who's the werewolf? Eh, who cares? It's a werewolf. Uh, but, yeah. But, you know, just wait. Wait until midnight on, a, on the night of a full moon. You'll find out who the <laughs> werewolf is. But this one actually, get, and I just saw, um, there's a movie opening, I'm trying to figure out when we released this. There's a movie opening this Friday in Toronto called Beast, which 
mm-hmm. has no werewolf in it and is very disappointing as a result. But it's about a young woman attracted to a young man who may or may not be behind this spate of, of murders in her little village on, on the Channel Islands. And the mistake it makes is it leans in so heavily to that erotic thriller trope of who the killer might be that every single male character has to be vaguely menacing at least once in the film just to keep it going and you're supposed to think who oh, he's we all, I, is the film trying to say that we all have the capacity for this or is it just bad writing that they're trying to cover up the fact that the, the killer's really obvious yeah and scream bless its heart it doesn't make it obvious it makes it it makes you work to follow the plot it does i think i had to watch this movie like 30 times until i like <laughs> remembered who the killers were okay. like i all i used to watch it and always forget which I think is just so so exciting. It makes it just like forever re- rewatchable. Well, there's also that moment when like Billy gets stabbed, mm-hmm. and like that's mm-hmm. that point where you're like, "Well, it's not, it's yeah. not Billy," and it hasn't entered into your head that there's two killers. Yeah, like I think that that's that's the genius point of it because there's so many other horror movies where it's just the one killer, it's the one villain. But in this, like that totally messes with your head. I was like, "Well, if it's not Billy, who the heck is it? What's going on? Yeah, yeah we haven't seen your dad. Maybe it really is her yeah, dad." Sure. You know, but he did seem really sweet when you saw him for, like, five seconds. And you're like, it can't. It's also not. Um, and also, like, they're just other teens. Yeah. Which is part of it. Like, they're not, like, some menacing, like, weirdo. You right. know? I mean, they're they're weirdos. But they're not, like, lurking around in the shadows. Like, they're kind of, like, among their peers. Mm. But and isn't killing that, them off. Isn't that the scariest part? Yeah. Though, is, like, the for these sure. guys that seem very charming. Which is such a serial killer Thing, yeah. though, right? Like, yeah. like a Ted Bundy who's like really charming and you don't suspect him like even if you're best friends with him you know like you just think that oh he's this nice guy Yeah. so you think these two guys are nice guys and you want to suspect Randy who's actually the nice guy the yeah. sweet guy mm-hmm. I would date Randy I guess <laughs> is what I'm trying to say um, but yeah but also I think what I re- like talked a lot about the guys but like I think what I really love about this movie is I love Sydney Prescott I think she's such a cool final girl. Yeah, she is a really strong character. And, and again, that's like Williamson just writing strong leads. Yes. But Nev Campbell, she was perfect for it. Yeah. When that happened, it's she was the sort of actor that everybody was kind of underestimating and nobody really gave her much credit for anything. And, you know, stuff like Wild Things came later. But she really does just slot right into a 1970s dependent like she's laurie strode in halloween she is the jamie lee curtis of the movie in that she is smart kind of um aware self-aware as well as aware of what's going on she's she's capable of navigating all this stuff and she's strong enough to survive it but also there's a chance she could die i mean there's there's a legitimately especially with the way scream opens by introducing and murdering poor drew barrymore which is like a perfect short film in itself it is it's my it's probably I would say my favorite opening scene of any movie ever. I love it so much. Every time I watch it, it just floors me. It is so scary and unrelenting mm. and creepy. And it always just, like, gets under my skin. And I remember, like, that is what, like, horrified me as a kid. And especially, like, the scene at, like, when her when her, her mother finds mm-hmm. her, like, hanging from a tree and she's, like, inside out. But even right before that, like, the part that kills me is when she's, like, trying to get yeah, mom she yeah. and she can't. Her. It's terrifying. Like, just the thought that, like, like you were almost saved. Oh, yeah. that's brutal. You know? Well, like, it makes it sadistic rather yeah. than just violent, right? Like, it's sadistic towards the audience. It's, yeah, it is. It's it is. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like, what? I, maybe this is kind of, like, me just, like, maturing or, like, getting older. But, like, the thing with, I used to, I never used to think about this with horror movies. But lately I've been thinking about, like... Just, like, the trauma that people in horror movies go through. Sure, and, yeah. like, how devastating it is. And, like, I felt so sad for her parents last night while I was watching this. Yeah. And I may... I mean, I haven't watched it in a few years. Maybe I felt it then. But I I just felt it, like, so acutely last night. Mm. And that struck me. We don't see them again in the film, do we? They no. They show up like Mrs. Kintner and Jaws and just have a moment. No. no. That'd be cool if they did. But no, it's just that one-off moment, which, yeah, makes it really scary because it's just, oh, for, well, first of all, you're like, Drew Barrymore's not going to die, and right. then she yeah. dies, and yeah. she's so good in that scene. Like, I, I feel like she's, you're so scared for her. Yeah. Um, but she's also so charming at the beginning. Yeah, no, the, the slide from kind of flirtatious confusion to terror yeah. Yeah. is handled really, really well, and almost, uh, when, the last time I looked at it, 
uh, was it was shocking that no one has given her other stronger stuff. That that she I know she's tried for roles and not got them, and she's settled into this romantic comedy thing for a while, and now on Santa Clarita Diet, she's just delightful. And, yeah, and, and <laughs> it's an amazing role for her. But there's like chops. She's got incredible dramatic chops in that. Scene. The part that kills me, and I, I actually. Again, I had never noticed this, which is shocking to me, considering how much I've watched it. But, like, there's the part when uh, Ghostface, like, asks her, like, um, the question about Friday the 13th, like, who's the killer on Friday mm-hmm. the 13th? Then she answers Jason, and it's actually Mrs. Voorhees. And then she goes, you tricked me. And it's, like, this very small yeah. line that she has. And, it, like, it just broke my heart. Yeah, yeah the betrayal of it. Because she was like, oh, I'm screwed now. Like, yeah. I'm, this is it. And it's, like, your favorite movie's turning against you. Yeah. And that's what I love about this scene is, like, literally, like, I can think of nothing better than, like, sitting at home on a Friday night eating popcorn and watching a movie. And and Wes Craven, like, uh, just presents that in such a, like, uh, enticing way because that's probably what he loves doing, too. So he gets it. He loves doing. Yeah. Mm. Oh, God. Sorry. (laughs) 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 Um, And... He went out doing what he loved. Yeah. He did. I I think... just the late career renaissance of Wes Craven. We were just talking about it. it like that's, it's he apparently he was a really sweet guy who never fought with anyone on his sets and was he just he made a lot of garbage and then suddenly got the chance to not make garbage. That was nice. Yeah, I he's one of my absolute favorites. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll get back. I, I'm yes. derailing all the conversation. No, no it's okay. It's, it's fine. He weaponized the experience that of seeing a movie at home, which is the, some, the yeah. something that in 1996 yeah. that people were really embracing. Like video was king. It, mm-hmm. Theaters were dying then, you know, for for that reason. And Scream reminded everybody of the the pleasure of being scared in the dark with a bunch of other people. Mm-hmm. There's nothing better to me, and I think that's the because I I mean, Scream isn't my favorite movie of all time, but um, like for me, there's nothing better than like a good horror movie that like trumps everything for me. But there are just so few of them. The really good ones. The, the re- repeatable yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's just what I love Scream for is that it's like a good horror movie that like for anyone who kind of like is a naysayer against horror movies, you can be like, well, here's Scream. Yeah. Here's something that like does something really interesting and smart and cool and it's scary and funny and like it's just it we're watching it last night I was like oh yeah this is why I love movies you know yeah yeah it's just I can't imagine not liking it like how how would you watch Scream and be like oh this sucks <laughs> yeah. I, I don't it just it's such a fun movie um, and it is really a movie like it like it's a perfect example of a movie just something yeah that you want to have popcorn and watch with mm-hmm. a group of friends and I've watched it so many times with groups of friends I actually remember like watching it with girls at a sleepover and I was like the weird girl that liked horror movies half the time the girls didn't want to watch them which sucked I didn't know you unfortunately yeah. but <laughs> but I remember them like watching the opening scene and being like I can't watch anymore it's too scary well the opening scene is too scary yeah but then it you know but mellows out it, it bombed me out because I was yeah. like trying to convince them I was like guys it's that's the scariest it's gonna get you're yeah. gonna be fine you're gonna have a good time and they're like <laughs> no it's hard yeah <laughs> I remember uh, I remember watching it with an audience that had no idea. Like, they clearly had no idea. It was wow. a 10 a.m. screening, a press screening at the Uptown One, and they, they made an event of it. They invited people. It was a big, packed house for both the first and second screen films. Miramax and, and Alliance back in the day did that sort of thing. Like, there was a 10 a.m. preview of Train Spotting that was packed with people. Wow. They, it was the equivalent now, I guess, would be an influencer screening where, you know, these people seem cool. Let's invite them to a free movie mm-hmm. and hope they talk about it. There was no social media then. You just got this fax saying, come here. <laughs> Yeah. In the early days, <laughs> I love that. there's a whole different world. <laughs> but yeah, at 10 a.m. on a like a Thursday morning, we went down and saw Scream, and it was like, everybody going in was just like, "Oh, it's Craven. Okay, mm-hmm. he hasn't done anything in a while." Right. Yeah. Uh, although I really like New Nightmare, the last of the the Freddy movies he made, which sort of prefigures Scream a lot. In totally. The, in the meta, the interactivity of it. Yeah. And kind of works now as the proof of concept. I think if you if you go back and watch it, it's it's kind of weird that there are two other Scream movies where they talk about people making a movie out of Scream, and that's the plot of New Nightmare. And it's not as funny, but it's legitimately terrifying. Yeah. And the Scream films are, are lighter just by nature. Yeah. But then, you know, you get to sit with 500 people in this theater in the dark and on a morning, like a 10 a.m. bleary morning, and just 
it ride. It's a ride. Like you just, mm-hmm. you, you strap in and it's just a, a delightful ride. And to get back to where I originally derailed this, a <laughs> lot of that is Nev Campbell steering, like sort of telling us, projecting the tone, getting it right, going from traumatized childhood pain to dynamic hero, uh, dynamic hero mm-hmm. and, and not, um, and never really winking. Like, the only time I think Sydney has ever winked in the entire four films is at the end of the second one where she says, not in my movie. And yeah. Like, that's cool. That's like the thing the hero says at the end of the movie. It's perfectly reasonable. But before Scream became Scream in the first movie, Campbell's playing the reality of it in just enough of a fun way that we're not, like, we're not terrified for her throughout. We're nervous. We're worried. But she's established as the hero so quickly that she will be the final girl, even before we had that phrase. We know she's going to survive the first few action sequences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and she fights back. Like, mm-hmm. when there's the time when she's, like, home alone, and then Ghostface shows up, and it's clearly Billy, because then he shows up right after yeah. that. But, yeah, she, like, fights him. Like, she's on the floor fighting with Ghostface. And I, I just was like, that is so great to me. Because, like, I, listen, I love Laurie Strode. Halloween is is my actual favorite movie, and I could talk about it forever, and I'm freaking out about the new movie. But anyways, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. But Laurie Strode, I love her, but, like, she... I mean, she fights back, but I feel like um, she's a little unsure, and she's still very afraid. But there's something about Sydney where, like, I, I don't feel like she's ever fully afraid. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, she is a little afraid because, quite frankly, she's going through some horrible things. But she, like is always ready to fight back. She's, she's in control. Yeah, she's very mm-hmm. in control, and I think, like, that's why she succeeds. Um, but also, just a, as a side point, like, there are two final girls in this movie. Gail Weathers is technically a final that's girl, true. too. Yeah. And it's... I don't know if you were at... There was a an event at the Royal Cinema here, the Black Museum. They do those, like, lecture yeah, series. No, and they I, did I wasn't there. They did a lecture about the best final girl. And there was these two girls... Well, came, a debate. Oh, yes. Yeah. They usually do lectures, but this was a debate. Yeah. And it was, like, um, people brought different final girls that they thought were, like, the best final girl. And, like, somebody brought um, Nancy from Nightmare on Elm Street, who ended up winning. Uh, Tam- uh, what's the name of the girl from The Witch? I don't know. Thomason. Thomason, yeah. And then... Um, and then, Na- and then Sally, Sally from, from Texas Chainsaw. And then these two girls brought Gail Weathers. They argued for Gail. And it... It was really compelling, actually. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's hard to argue against her. Well, listen, Gail's in all of the other movies along with Sydney. And Gail, like, really comes through in the end of the yeah. movie. Like, um, you kind of hate Gail, but I love that her and Sydney, over the course of the franchise, sort of become friends. Yeah. Um, and, like, partners in fighting against this, yeah, yeah, these yeah. horrible people that keep, keep coming after yeah. them. Which makes a lot of sense emotionally, even if it doesn't necessarily plot-wise, that they would bond over that because no one else... You know, they're used to not being believed. They're used to being attacked yeah. and assaulted. And also, after a while, I, it's like survivors of some sort of accident where you're the, it's it's crash or fearless. You know, the only other person who understands you is the person who was there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And also is Courtney Cox, who is just remarkably great. She's so good. Uh, and she's just like a like a like a cool, <laughs> a cool working woman, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and she just like gets the story no matter what. And like people kind of like find that as like a bad quality but it's not it's it's cool you know i love her yeah i I love her too i like tabloid journalism too so i feel like i'm on her side yeah i'm on her side too and we love true crime so i feel like yeah listen if i could read the woodsboro murderous book i would i buy it tomorrow (laughs) yeah i'd probably buy surprise no one has published one at this point i know fan fiction version there's probably someone on etsy that's made like a cover that you can have which I should look into yeah. or make now that sure. I'm thinking yeah. about it. Letters from Cotton Weary. <laughs> um, but, like, also, speaking of Cotton Weary, like, they set up all these other things in here that, like, will lead to all these sequels. Like, the Cotton Weary thing is, like, a brief mention. Mm-hmm. And, like, also the fact that Sydney's mom, like, died. I mean, that really comes to play in Stream 3. But that, there's just, Sydney's going through so much. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. she's very complicated. Not just Ghostface, but, like, she's she's had this previous trauma. Yeah. She starts off almost as, like, a final girl, so to speak. She's already been through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now she has to face it again, and maybe that's what makes her stronger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In that she's already suffered a little bit, and she's like, I'm not going to let anything else get to me. Yeah, I do like that her default response is anger rather than fear. Like, she punches. Mm-hmm. Yes. She lashes out at people who attack her. Even, you know, Gail Weathers. Um 
their their relationship is absolutely antagonistic for the first two movies, I think, maybe even into three. But she's yeah. she's got no time for anything else. She's short tempered, justifiably. She's not written as a as an angry person, but Campbell somehow gives you that core, that that backbone that Sydney needs to survive, even before any of that happens. And the thing that the thing that I just love the most about it is that she is and she's smart. She thinks her way through this stuff. Um, you mentioned Laurie Strode being kind of reactive, which yeah. is fair. But the other thing about that is that Halloween, the problem with Halloween ultimately is that, uh, not not the film, I love the film, but the problem with the Halloween concept is that Michael Myers is indestructible. You can't relate mm-hmm. to him. You can, he's a Terminator. You can't reason with him. You can't bargain with him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He yes. wants to kill you, and eventually he kills you. And whoever's under the mask in Scream... You can break their ribs, you can mm-hmm. knock them down, you can knock them out, you can hit them with a car, they will, they're mortal. And and that makes it, you know, for the first time in, in a lot of this genre stuff, or certainly for the first time in a lot of people seeing Scream, who were raised on Friday the 13th and Halloween, there's a there's an equal footing. Like, it's a fair fight. Right. I never thought about it like that, but that's totally true. Well, it makes it easier to root for uh, for Sydney, I think, just because she could actually land a punch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you she could take this person down. And she and Ghostface is smaller. Like, it always doesn't seem to be, like, a huge person mm-hmm. under the suit. Well, because it's, like, a real person. Yes. So. Yes. It's not just, like, yeah, a, monster a monster size. Like, Jason yeah. seems to get bigger every single yeah. time yeah. I see him. Um, Less skin, more size. It's weird. Yes. It's, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> He's, like, waterlogged yeah. <laughs> permanently. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, that that's, that's really interesting. I've never thought about it that way. And I mean, like... Uh, I listen. I sorry. I'm not trying to rag on Laurie Strode, who's my absolute favorite final girl. But I think like maybe she reacts more like like a person would react, and that yeah. you would be scared. But I think like I, what I like about Sydney is she's like someone to aspire to, because like she just makes me go like just you can take on any, anything if you really put your mind to it and really fight back. Um, and I love that. It like I think that Nancy from A Nightmare on Elm Street is like similar kind of character, which is like. Why I've always loved Wes Craven, because I think that, like, those two final girls, like, were such a big part of my childhood, and that, like, me loving horror films was I was like, look at these girls fighting back. Look at what they're doing. Nancy's so smart, she sets traps for Freddy. Yeah, she hides a coffee maker under the bed, which is incredibly dangerous, but (laughs) good for her. Totally. But I feel like Sydney would do the same thing, and actually, she kind of does, does, like, later on in the series, she, like, basically, like, lives in seclusion... And, like, sets, you know, alarms and has things ready to go because she knows what's happened. And um, I love seeing that. I love seeing that. It's just, it's just, it's so, I feel like it's empowering. Do you feel the same? Yeah, I I don't look at it like that, but I can see it. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I just, I love it. It makes me, it just makes me want to kick some ass. I don't know. (laughs) I grew up on Buffy, too, right? Yeah, so. well, I, I was going to bring up Whedon, because I think without Williamson, the template for Buffy would be very different. I mean, Joss Whedon had already written Buffy the Vampire Slayer and made the movie in 92, but nobody yeah. got it. Mm-hmm. And Scream and Dawson's Creek came along and sort of paved the way again and said, no, no, self-aware characters in genre situations are totally doable. You just have to trust the writing. And that's how the show is born and saves the day, really. Yeah, and I mean... Buffy and, and this came out around the same time. So, I mean, that's why I am the way that I am. I feel like it's, <laughs> yeah. like, so formative. Well, what's so interesting for me is that I, like, I love Williamson, but, like, I am so not into Buffy. I'm so mm. not into Cab- Cabin in the Woods. Like, there's something about, like, Joss Whedon's sensibility that just doesn't connect with me for some reason. And I I don't have, like, a firm understanding of, like, Whedon's work enough to really, like, understand why, but, like, I just, I've never, I tried watching Buffy, like, because I know Emily, like, loves it so much, and I have a few friends who love it, so I've tried getting into it, and I, like, for the life of me, just can't, um, and I don't know why, but I love Williamson's work. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I find really interesting, though, is, like, we, like, hoist up, like, a Williamson or a Whedon, but, like, we don't want to support Diablo Cody when she makes Jennifer's body, which I think is, like, a very self-referential movie and, like, really shit upon because she wrote it. Like, mm-hmm. she can't be self-referential and, like, fun and whatever. Like, these guys can and, like, that's their brand, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what happened with Jennifer's body. I mean, I, I saw it at the time and thought it was fine. Yeah. But I don't know. It. I don't. I don't know that I blame Cody for that. I think my problems with it are really more about the execution and how it just sort of stumbles in the last third. 
But yeah. yeah, you're right. It wasn't embraced on the level that it could have been. And I mean, people still hated Megan Fox then too. Yeah, and she had everything of... is sort of stacked against it. Totally. But I mean, and I'm not saying it's as good as Scream or anything. I mean, Scream, like Scream is a perfect movie, and Jennifer's body has flaws. But but it could certainly be rediscovered. I mean, there's no reason yeah. people wouldn't understand it now. Yeah. You know, to get what, what I mean, I guess maybe you just need to lay out the tone and explain what it's going for. Sort of let people in personally, as as opposed to within the film, just sort of say, no, no, give it twenty minutes and see if it works. Yeah. But it's um, I, I don't know. I re- I just I remember feeling like, um, yeah, you could just tell it wasn't gonna, the people weren't gonna connect to it. There was something about it. Maybe it was. Yeah, I'll just I'll get that just in case. Nope, hate some. Um. Always ghost face calling. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Don't even say that. That scares me. You want the app. Right? Like during the day. Yeah. A daylight call. They a never daylight did call. do that, did they? No. Is there a cell phone call or something? Menacing? <sighs> Later on. Yeah, there is in like the fourth one. Yeah. I feel like. Because um, yeah. they're all younger, right? Um, but... Yeah. Well, that's the other thing too. I mean, to just to wheel it back into, into Scream and, mm-hmm. and the, I think like, it had to be now the the 90s horror wave is so defined as the 90s horror wave we all know what it is we all yeah. know what to look at I and mean, even just the the cover design for the scream dvd that we're or the blu-ray that we're looking at here is the classic miramax putting a bunch of young actors in black shirts mm-hmm. um, I know. yeah and, and so they moody did they did that for 30 or 40 <laughs> films even stuff where it shouldn't have been like phantoms yeah. yes the totally underrated phantoms <laughs> i have such a soft spot for that weird weird movie but as a like all of that comes from Scream more than any other yeah. work. Like I know what you did last summer. I like it a lot, but it is very much uh, a, a film that is um, anchored to John Carpenter and, mm-hmm. and, and specific stylistic things where the script almost seems to fight with it sometimes because the script is too self-aware for the movie. The movie is very serious and, and, and deals with its horror aspects in a really literal sort of almost grinding way where, you know, oh, he can't possibly be there. Yes, he is. But no, he can't. Yes, he is. No, like, in the Scream movies, we'd already be past this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the Scream movie, the original Scream, and then the sequel, which is just, I I mean, I love it. I think it's really, really smart about what it does. I love it, too. We saw it we, Yeah, oil. we came to your, when oh, you programmed the, the it. Oh, now screening. Yeah. Yes. How did that yeah, play? Yeah. I, could, I couldn't stay for it. Did, I think it played well. It? Yeah, played I think so. very well. Yeah. Um, I, like, personally, I love Scream, too. Like, I think it's like number one, number two for me in the ranking. I just think it's so smart. Yeah. And I actually have a hard time watching the first one without thinking about the second one. Like, you know, the scene in the hallway with like Billy and Sydney. Like, I always think about the Tory spelling, like, and, um, oh my God, what's his name? Luke Wilson, like, right. take in stab in that stab, they show yeah. in the second one. Like, I just can't not think of it. And I feel so bad because, like, Nev Campbell's so good in that scene. And I was like, all I'm thinking of is Tory <laughs> spelling, which is so funny. But yeah, it's such, it's such a good movie, yeah. I think. The, I mean, it has a brilliant opening scene too. Yep. Yeah. Well, we, I was going to say that the thing about the th- the other thing about the Scream uh, series, all four films, is that it is uh, it is beholden to that format. That like the Bond films that uh, that had been going on for twenty five years beforehand, you have to open thirty five years. Jesus, you have to open <laughs> with an unrelated prequel sequence, like a, a prologue that has really very little to do. Although in the case of Scream, it is directly connected to everything that follows. Uh, and then two had to find a meta narrative, and then three had to find a meta meta narrative, and then four I don't even remember what they did. I think it was something to do with the opening. Yeah, it was like opening within an opening within yeah, an opening. Yeah, it was like they recursive. Were wa- girls were watching one of the stab sequels, and it was it was a bit much. I mean, it was kind of cool the first time, but then you watch it again, and you're like, oh okay. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, and I'm I'm sure at the time it was the only way to do it, right? You you just write yourself into this idea of the best opening, which is then immediately the silliest opening because the simplicity of the first one and the second one where we immediately open with uh, a narrative an, an in-universe argument about why the movie we are watching is unnecessary mm-hmm. and then it just ups the stakes and goes on and and yeah and it has timothy Olyphant, so it's automatically great <laughs> he's really good at he it he is and laurie metcalf laurie metcalf yep. That my favorite killer duo i think <laughs> yeah they were great oh uh, they were excellent but you know what Danita and I kind of talk about like what scares us and stuff and Mm -hmm. I mean I think we have different opinions on like 
I think I'm not as scared of supernatural stuff. Right. Um, but we often talk about, like, how scary just, like, someone coming to get you is and, like, somebody, like, stabbing you. And I think, like, as silly as, like, the ghost face costume is in the Scream series, like, the fact that you're just getting stabbed, like, really is what irks me. Because that just feels very real. Like, it brings you back into reality. Like, in the second one, she just gets, like, stabbed in front of everybody. And, like, yeah. I, I just, it's horrifying when you watch her die up on the stage like that. When it's horrifying when Drew Barrymore gets st- just stabbed. Yeah. She just she just stabbed and she dies. And I was like, that could be you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, not, yeah, not, not you specifically. <laughs> but, you know? Yeah. No, I know. It's, it's, it's like, a, a touch of realism in a movie that's a little bit, like, not super real because it's so self-referential, but, like... It always brings you back. Yeah, the you know? stakes are always real. Yes. I mean, people could die. People could be hurt. I think that. I. I mean, again, I'm flashing back to the first screening, and there's that moment where uh, whoever's in the suit stumbles over. I think it's the kitchen island or something, and just just misses and falls. And people laughed and immediately stopped laughing. Yeah. Because it's totally human and unexpected. The, the one thing you've never seen in a horror movie is the killer not being fluid, graceful, hulking, and terrifying. And just watching somebody mess up and fall over. Mm -hmm. It's a jolt. And then they immediately snap back to being, no, 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 because he got up again. And that's that that constant balance of, this is only a movie, I'm sitting in a theater watching something that is very much aware of its moviness, versus the people I like are still getting stabbed and crying and dying. Like, the emotional realism of these movies is, or at least the first two, is is really, I mean, it's a, it's a hard tightrope to walk, and it, it pulls it off. Both of them actually make it work really well. I was, I, I, I still, I can't believe I fell for it, but the Jerry O'Connell stuff in, in 2 is really adorable and sweet, and uh, again, that game where he's pre- presented as a possible suspect, but if you go back the second time, you're just watching some really nice person <laughs> be completely misunderstood and then die. Yeah. And it's tragic. Like it's, it's really sad. It actually. lands, yeah. I know. I know. Do you? What's your favorite of the sequels? I don't. I'm. I don't have a, a true love for the sequels, really. Um, mm-hmm. I. I saw. I probably saw them as they came out, mm. and then. You're just an originalist. I'm an originalist, uh, for sure. And then I think, like, since Emily and I have become friends, she's so into sequels. Um, so I've kind of just like through osmosis, like <laughs> have gotten into Nightmare on Elm Street sequels and the Scream sequels. And I do, I like them, but I don't, I'm like, oh, like I'm over it, you know? Like I, I kind of. I think it's just that like, Danita doesn't like get obsessed with anything. No, like, I don't. She, she I don't. She doesn't get too into anything. No. She likes stuff, but she doesn't get too into it. Yeah. Well, this uh, explains why you're immune to Whedon. Because, like, that's yeah, a I think you know what? That might yeah. be it. You, yeah, I think you guys cracked the code. <laughs> yeah, that might be it. I'm just kind of and I'm and I'm kind of like turned off by obsession a little mm. bit. Yeah, like, she I just like it. I think <laughs> like it makes me uncomfortable, you know, in a way. Um, Whereas, like, I just like get very into things, not in a crazy way. No, you're like, not, you're not, but I, obsessive. but I, I really like. I like to, like, extend the life of something. Like, if I'm very into it, like, I, w- I want more of it. So, like, even if the sequels aren't <laughs> great, I'm just like, oh, I, I'm excited to have more of this. Yeah. And it's, like, the same way I feel about this new Halloween movie where I'm like, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be perfect, but, like, I just want Laurie Strode. Like, I need more Laurie Strode in my life. And I, she looks incredible. And, you know, so I'm, I'm just I'm just so psyched about it. And I think the Scream, like, uh, quadrilogy. Quadrilogy now, I guess. Uh, like, <laughs> I like them all in their own way. Like, yeah, they are fun. Three and four, I would say, sillier than the first two, but I still enjoy them. The third one's, like, very meta in a way that I find, like, a little bit much at times. Mm. Um, but the fourth one, I actually, like, I saw that in theaters, and that was... Yeah. Um, not the first Scream I saw in theaters. The first one I saw in theaters was three, because I made my dad take me, <laughs> and I found out later he doesn't like horror movies. He, he was like, oh, I just went because he really wanted to go. Oh, that's really sweet. So <laughs> cute. I know. What was his experience of that? I mean, seeing a sequel to a movie... Seeing a sequel in a genre he doesn't particularly like. I mean, he seemed to like it enough. Yeah. Um, I think that just my mom absolutely cannot stand horror movies. Like, she's too scared of them, so I think she would never take me. Otherwise, she would have taken me, because my mom is the best, and she she goes to see most things with me. Mm-hmm. But my dad, I think... Also, my dad, like... Oh, this is just getting too far into my personal life, but he wasn't home a lot when I was really young, because he was working all the time. So I think, like, he took opportunities to hang out with me when he could get them. So he took me to see that in theaters, and I was so excited. 
Um, it was like when I saw I Still Know What You Did Last Summer in theaters. I think he also took me to see right. that. And I was like so excited because I hadn't been able to see the originals in theaters. Mm-hmm. I was still too young to be seeing these things. Yeah, but yeah. I went anyway. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I think we talked about this the other night. Like I one of my like first horror movie experiences in the theater was probably Final Destination. Okay. Which is like really like a direct like like cousin of Scream. Yeah. Um and I just I think, like, what I miss about horror movies today is, like, they're not fun anymore. Or the fun ones are just so bad that they're not fun. Yeah. That they're, like, like... Well, it's camp happy, instead of... Happy Death Day comedy. was, like, the worst thing that I've ever seen. And oh, I know really? people really liked it. Liked. Liked okay. It. No, I hate it. I just hated I it. I that. really hated it. Um, was it the frustration? I don't know. I just thought it was so stupid. And I hated the, like, the, like, girl-on-girl fighting, and, like, there was just some, I don't know, I just didn't like it. Um, but, like, Emily just saw Hereditary last night, and I saw it, like, a few weeks ago, and it's so buzzed about, but it's, and it's good, it's fine, but it's not, like, horror's just kind of turned into, like, this, like, prestigious thing now because they want to like elevate the yeah, genre the elevated horror but it's like yeah. it's its horror doesn't thing. need to be elevated horror when it's good is the greatest um so i think watching scream last night i was like oh this is fun like this is what i'm missing and i don't know maybe we're like too um like we're not like earnest enough as a society anymore to like enjoy a movie like scream like think, yeah, you know, but they just don't like I. I, just don't make I know, like at twenty eight, I don't want to be like they just don't. They don't make movies like that anymore. You're not wrong though. I mean, it's true. If if somebody, I, I mean, maybe it's just that Scream Four underperformed, and they decided that that was it. Some cultural yeah. shift happened, and we were all going to start exploring. I mean, I like I think something like It Follows comes close. Mm-hmm. Where yeah. the characters may not reference other horror movies, but the movie is aware of things in, in a way that makes it fun. And also legitimately scared. But that movie is also, like... It's still elevated horror. It, it is. Like, looks yeah. really good, and I... I don't love It Follows, but I won't get into that. That's a whole other conversation. Okay. But I think it's it's definitely referencing things in a less direct way, for sure. Um, but there are some movies that I think that get put under the rug that kind of have a similar spirit. The movie I'm thinking of in particular is Tragedy Girls, which I, like... Oh, so good. And I... I loved that movie. Yeah, that it was the best. It didn't get a big release. No, it and barely played at all. It was at uh, Toronto After Dark yeah. last year and then just VOD, I think. Yeah, that's where we saw it. Mm-hmm. And I just, like, that's the kind of movie that I'm looking for where it's, like, it's fun. It's a it's a nice ride. And that movie actually surprised me just in the places that it went. Like, it mm-hmm. had a pretty dark ending. Um, <laughs> and, like, I was just like, oh, okay. Um, but it also was, like, really gory and, like, I don't know, it just... That was a really fun time at a horror movie. Yeah. And I, I haven't had that kind of experience in a long time. So I, I'm kind of looking forward to see whatever that director does next. But also yeah. I would just like to see, yeah, more fun horror movies. More like, fun horror movies. Like, don't take it so seriously. Or, like, if you're going to take it seriously, take it full serious and make something like The Others. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't know why. But I that's well, I love, what I yeah. love The Others. Yeah, I love The Others, too. Yeah. Um, but, like, go full ghost story or go fun. Yeah. You know, like... It's, There's just all of these, like, very, like, complicated, like, it's a horror movie, but it's about, like, underlying grief. And, like, I get that, like, genre is, all like, almost always allegorical. Like, sure, that's yeah. the point of genre. But I think they're, like, I mean, Scream is about stuff, yeah. you know? So I think there's, like, a balance. And there's just, like, these, like, heavy, heavy horror movies, which I guess is, like, it's kind of reflective because we're living in heavy times. Where, but that's when you need the fun you know, stuff. But that's, like, that's yeah. when you need the anti-venom. Yeah. You need something that's that's more engaged with entertainment as well as. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, I like Hereditary. It's one of the most conflicted movie reviews I've ever written because I like it, I admire it, I appreciate it, but I also think that once it clarifies itself and tells you what it is, it gets less interesting. Like, totally. That's that pretty first much what we hour said last of familial night. tension and yeah. and and mental illness and all the stuff that it's playing with. That's the most interesting thing about horror to me is when you watch a movie where, um, you know, uh, where where the character's psychological issues are pre-existing and magnified by whatever's going on, mm-hmm. and where maybe it doesn't have to have what it has. And I'm still, again, not going to spoil Hereditary because it just opened and this is dropping the week after. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, the second half of that movie goes to places where I, I I get it, I understand it, I appreciate it, but it was less interesting watching it go through those final paces. Yeah, and why does it have to be this big, th- like, 
you know, ending. I think maybe we're caught up on, like, this big ending. And what I like about Scream is that, like, it, I mean, it just ends. Like, yeah. they defeat them, and then that's the yeah. ending. I, I love the yeah. ending as Gail Weathers, like, reporting from the scene. Yeah. And then you get this this big shot of just, like, the horizon. Like, it just, it's just perfect. Like, it doesn't... I guess, like... Yeah, it's the end of Lethal Weapon, weirdly enough. <laughs> that's what they're quoting deliberately as they really? pull out. I think so. That and a bunch of... And Die Hard. It's all yeah. the action. It's how the action movie ended in yeah. the 80s. So in the 90s, that's how horror movies ended. I can see that now that you say that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, um, pull back I, to Carnage. Yeah, but I love that it's Gail and that she's like an act... It's not just like a random reporter. It's Gail who's yeah. part of the story. Um, so, like, it's weird to call Scream simple because, like, there's a lot going on. But I think, like, the simplicity of Scream is at the core of it. It's just a simple story with, like, added elements. And I think the simplicity is missing from horror. Like, it's, like, either yeah. trying to do too much or too little. Yeah. And, I like, there's a happy medium. And I think something like Hereditary, to me, is just trying to do too much. When, if it had just dialed back just a little bit, it, I probably would have loved it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And I think you feel the same. I feel exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. So. I think there's a point now in, in elevated horror, and I don't even accept that that's a thing. I no, think just, no we don't. It's, it's a fashion for horror. But it's it's serious horror. That's all it is. It's, yeah. you know, it's Robert Wise's The Haunting versus The Legend of Hell House, where one is taking it seriously, not showing the ghost ever, and just making it all work with suggestion and, and you know, bulging doors and things, versus Hell House, where people are running around screaming, going insane, there's monsters and stuff. I, they're both satisfying. They both work. It doesn't mean they have to fight with each other for dominance. They just happen to be different spins on the same thing. Uh, where we are now with... I mean, It Comes at Night is one I keep coming back to, which is a film that I still don't fully like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the actors. I think the premise is interesting. And then I think that just the fact that so much of it depends on room tone and nightmares yeah. and jump scares that aren't real. The thing about the screen movies is that they are always set in, in an, a shared acknowledged reality, uh, the same way Halloween was. The sequels, maybe not so much, but you know, the, 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 the lines are very clear. The stakes are very simple. Someone is trying to kill these people and why... And that's all you need. And from there, you just build out interesting stuff. You have conversations, you have characters, you have dialogue, you have all the things that, you know, movies are made of. And with Scream and Scream 2, especially, there is an, an element of participation and the audience is invited in yeah. to be part of it. And, and that's what's, that's just what's fun about it, too, is, like, there's nothing better than, like, being in on a joke, mm, you know? And yeah. that's, like, what Scream, like, bases itself on. Yeah. You and know? even if you're not a horror fan, I feel like you can get the references, like... Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't well, I don't know. Them. They well, yeah, it's it's in passing. There, you know, there's other things to like derive pleasure from out of this movie. Yeah, but it's like an added pleasure if you get it. But I think they're like they're Easter eggs for like, I hate saying real fans, but people that really do love the sure. genre for sure. Like there's a couple levels of references. Well, there's like. For example, in the first scene, like, the mom or dad is like, go over to the Mackenzie's, which is a reference to Halloween when Laurie's like, go over to the Mackenzie's to the kids. Yeah. And, like, so that's a reference. But then there's stuff, like, when she says, like, out of some West Carpenter well, yeah. flick or whatever. Like, that I think is, like, general enough that somebody could get it. And also we have Randy, who is, like, this, like, conduit for us for understanding, um the genre and and this in the place of the genre like mm-hmm. he's talking about movies but he's saying the names prom night he's like yeah he, he's kind of giving you a quick like history lesson on horror movies in the movie so that yeah. you can catch up yeah, yeah. You know? that's true um i was i read before coming here i read um roger ebert's review oh you did and, yeah and he he really liked it he but was on in, board, yeah. yeah he was super on board uh <laughs> he's all he's on we have similar tastes yeah <laughs> with, with ebert um but he in in like kind of like the opening couple sentences he says this is a movie for people like for people like who read Fangoria magazine right and then his closing his closing kind of statement is like uh, this movie won't be for everyone but if you read Fangoria and knew what I was talking about this mo- this is for you yeah um, so I think I think it's just funny that he kind of like tapped into that too yeah and um, that is the same attitude that that Williamson and Craven have which is you know like we know what we're doing. You can trust us very quickly, establishing that, and then inviting you along instead of putting up walls. I mean, now, I, I was trying to think about this earlier today. Could you make Scream work now? And it would just, mm-hmm. even Scream 4 has people rushing to the internet to, to check things, and it's too complicated. Mm-hmm. Like the present day, plus you would have, 
you know, half the horror nerds in the movie, the characters in the movie, would be arguing over specifics. You know, like you would, yeah, well, that's not right. The ghost face mask is slightly off. And I know this one was the mm-hmm. knockoff that came out later. You know, there's a certain pleasure in knowing that William Shatner's face was the, the, the basis for the Michael Myers mask. That this, or this lovely little story of just people figuring out a way to make something scarier. They bought a mask, they painted it white, put it on a guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it. Scream never has moments where you are stopped dead to think about the origins of the things that are happening that just it all happens really quickly in passing you know it's um oh it's a department store costume you can buy those anywhere it's it's great because Mm -hmm. it just means everyone is a suspect and and any piece of cellophane in the background of a shot could be someone opening a new costume and putting it on in the next movies and now i think there's so much you know trailers are dissected frame by frame and people spend endless hours investing in fan theories which I mean, they never work. They don't mm-hmm. add anything to the to the to the pleasure. Oh, this is why I don't. I'm 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 a reverse nerd. I won't watch trailers if I can help it. I don't mm-hmm. watch TV spots. I don't want images in my head before I see a movie because then I'll start trying to figure out where the image goes mm-hmm. and or why mm-hmm. this character is in trouble now when I've seen another scene before or later in the trailer where presumably that person will live to have that moment. I just it's too complicated, and and. Film culture is going into a place, especially with genre, like the superhero movie thing where, oh, who will survive in the next Avengers movie? Well, the movie will tell you if you want to. <laughs> the next movie yeah, will have I all know, that information. I don't, that's the thing that like drives me crazy is all the speculation. Like, Or even with like TV shows. It's like, who cares? Just watch it when it comes out. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> let the movie... <laughs> like, go. relax. Yeah, let the story points come when you're supposed to. Yeah, go. yeah. And I don't know if you could make a film like certainly like the first, maybe even the second Scream, um, work now because just the announcement of it would start picking, having mm-hmm. people pick it apart and who's cast in this role and what this means. We haven't even gotten to the fact that no one else could play Dewey. That, that <laughs> oh, no. David Arquette is a singular <laughs> performance in, the, in all four films. Yeah. That, that, you know, the fact that he is a credible threat in the first movie mm-hmm. and then subsequently kind of the heart of the, the entire franchise mm-hmm. yeah. and still just an idiot. Yeah. Like yeah. He, he's working on multiple levels in a really entertaining way. Yeah, I love that for when he's like, I was 24 for a whole year. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, oh my God. And you really root for their romance. I mean, yeah. it helps that they, you know, actually ended up getting sure. together and they have a real chemistry, but totally. Everybody, I think, in this movie was like cast so well. Like, I think mm-hmm. every single actor is perfect for it. Even, like, Henry Winkler as the princer. Yeah. Prince yeah. is just, like, genius. Yeah. Your heart goes right out to him. Yeah. yeah. And, um... But, like, I, I also love Rose McGowan as Tatum. Like, she yeah. has some of my favorite lines. Which... And my favorite death, like, maybe oh. of all time. Like, yeah. that, like, death in the garage door is just so good. Mm-hmm. It was just so clever. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to, like, find interesting ways to kill people because everything's been done. Sure. So when there is, like, a... Like a an interesting way that someone dies, I live for it. Yeah. I live for it. And that's that always sticks out. Like, when, when people are talking about, like, favorite movie deaths, like, that's always one of mine. Yeah. It's a good one. It's so good. You and it just goes up so slowly. Yeah. It's just great. You were mentioning the Final Destination movies, and, and that I think that sequence is the closest to it because the joy of the Final Destination movies, in a really weird way, is that we can see it coming and, yeah. and get to watch. And, and in the sequels, they would just start to trick you and come up with yeah. incredible, like, Rube Gold. Murders I love those so movies bizarre. the most. Like my mom and I text each other all the time about like Final Destination deaths that we see like in the news. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like there was like there was actually just like a recent like thing that went viral, like a photo of like a like a like a a skeleton, uh, like a like a fossilized skeleton, basically, and oh, it was the like thing. yeah, yeah, like he like escaped like a volcano, and then like a rock fell on his head, Aww. and so I sent that to my mom, and we were just like Final Destination, <laughs> like even in like the Middle Ages, that was the first one, that was the first one, <laughs> pretty cool. Or there was like like I heard, I just assumed it was a bunch of archaeologists staging something. Well, yeah, sure, because nothing possible. is real anymore, and it, and cynicism is the only proper default. But yeah. uh, but like e- there was like great. there was like this this one like a few years ago i heard about like this woman who was just like on the beach and it was kind of a windy day but like nothing nothing crazy and like a beach umbrella like impaled her and she died i was like and i again text my mom being like final destination <laughs> like she escaped death at some point like that week <laughs> and it came back right. for her you know and i just yeah final destination is a movie that's just like permeated my psyche um 
in a way that I find fun. <laughs> <laughs> Those movies are fun. They're is, so is fun. messed up because you're yeah. like, well, it's literally about people dying. Like every time, you know, pretty much everybody's going to die because yeah. death is the villain of the movie and yeah. we're rooting for death. Yeah. You're yeah. rooting for death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which we are in all of them anyway, right? The yeah. Friday the 13th movies especially, they're just, you don't care about the characters. You're just waiting to see how they get dispatched. Totally. Yeah. And Scream reverses that too and yeah. makes you want them to survive because even though the requirements of the movie are that you have to you know a bunch of teenagers have to die before someone learns a lesson at least in scream those people are interesting they have lives and yeah we root for them and and it's and again it establishes that so just so beautifully in the opening sequence with Bar- with Barrymore and then just keeps finding new ways for us to invest in in these poor people who are really just there to you know have too much gel in their hair and then be killed <laughs> I even like it's so messed up but I like even like care about Billy and Stu <laughs> like, to, like a little bit. Like, I'm just, I'm invested in them, too. Like, the part when Stu is like, my mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> that part always gets me, it's which funny. is, like, it's funny. Yeah, it's really funny. And apparently funny. he, like, ad-libbed that. And right. then Russ Perry was like, that's brilliant. I have to keep that in. I can see that. But, but, like, I just, that seems so real to me. And, I, like, I'm also, like, horrified of, as to what he's done. But I'm like, oh, my God, like, he's... Yeah, if he gets through this, he's screwed. His yeah. mom and dad are going to be really <laughs> mad at him, you know? Yeah. It, it makes him pathetic in a way that yeah, none for of the sure. other horror villains ever really is, right? Yeah, yeah. which I love. Yeah. Because they are pathetic guys. Yeah. It's so sad. Like, the whole conceit is that they're, like, they were basically, like, upset about um, the affair that was happening. Yeah. And that they decided that they're going to, like, kill the, her mom. A bunch mm-hmm. of people. Yeah, yeah. like, it's just, it, it just... It's it's messed up. Anyways, they're all like terrible men. Perfect example of terrible men. <laughs> well, that's that's the other thing I was I was trying to figure out is that that the the movies I don't know that you can make a screen movie now in the current climate of well, for lack of a better term wokeness of 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 a, of a woke screen movie because mm-hmm. so much of it depends on baiting and switching about who a nice guy is and who he isn't and I don't think at this point anyone would believe anybody. Mm-hmm. There, which could work. For the mystery of it, but at the same time, people would believe Sydney more quickly. There would just be like the, the atmosphere has changed, and also, of course, all of these films were produced by Harvey Weinstein, which is another yeah. total yeah weird yeah. smear yeah. on them. Yeah, not well, Bob, I suppose, his enabler. The, yeah, the Dimension Films was run by by Brother Bob, but uh, yeah, it, these are actually the movies that I've been using as examples of. You know, when can you watch a, a movie again with his name on it? It's like, right. when the screen movies let you root for. Yeah, I know. It's it's something that's like I, I had a bit of trouble with when everything fully came out that I was like, Can I love these movies still? And I mean, there's just so much in my lifeblood that I like I can't really let them go. Um, but I mean when I watch a movie and I see that this is like literally about the trauma of a woman, I'm just like, I can't believe that these are the movies that they were greenlighting yeah. when they were literally doing that, which makes me hate them more. Um, but also like should I not, you know, watch a story about a woman overcoming trauma and feel uplifted by it, by it too? Like, I don't know. It's it's very complicated. Um, it really is. I right? Mean, there's, no, there's no right answer. There are a lot of wrong ones, but there, there doesn't seem to be a right answer on this yet. Nobody's... And I, I struggle with this constantly. I don't... I think we all get to decide what we keep from, from these things, mm-hmm. and... It's easier for me, I guess, because once he didn't direct the movies, he simply got them made totally. and commissioned them. It's a more, more of a controlling thing going on. But also, yeah, Rose McGowan is in this movie, and Rose McGowan went through some really horrible shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is the worst part for me, mm-hmm. uh, I think. Um, but it's it's really tough. But I, I mean, I, I love this movie so much, I can't ignore that it exists. I mean, I knew about it before. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I love, I love, I honestly love Wes Craven so much. Um, so that sort of maybe I don't want to say Trump's it but like I I felt like he was like a real supporter of female characters and so I love that I love that part of it and that's what I take away from it even music of the heart like I said right exactly <laughs> you know yeah. like he's he's made quite a few uh vehicles starring women and I'm, sure and that's that's excellent to me and I mean I guess Kevin Williamson has written some stuff too um but yeah yeah I just I you know we're in a place now where Every day there's the possible revelation of something else that you love that has to go away for a while. Yeah. And that's... Yeah, it wears on you a little. Well, so. there's lots of other things to pick apart in, in this movie, too, that, like, could make you not want to watch it. Like, you're talking about, like, wokeness, which is something... A word that I, like, hate, but... I know, I'm choking. <laughs> there's just nothing else that works right now. But, like, there's no black people in this movie. 
Yeah, they introduced him in the second one. That's yeah, funny. and they probably did that because before, like, there's no black people <laughs> end screen, you know? And it's and it's like, oh, but they also, like, die immediately mm-hmm. yeah. at the start of the movie. It's a weird unconscious bias of a lot of horror films from the 70s that got carried over, I think, into yeah. Williamson's script. Just that, you know, like Halloween is Lily White and Friday the 13th, when it had black characters, they were like Michael T. Williamson in the fifth one where he was just a, an asshole, mm-hmm. you know, in a studded caricature and all that. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean to defend it, but it's it's a trap I can easily see someone falling into because they're just replicating the things that they saw, mm-hmm. which yeah. is the whole problem. Yeah. But it's like, this also was trying to reinvent things. Yeah, so yeah. like, maybe it could have had an opportunity to do that. But it's like, you know what? Now that I think about it, like, Get Out might be like, um, like the next generation of a scream because it's a smart movie. Yeah. It's funny. It also has some scares, and it's saying something bigger. Like I think, like that's the closest that we've probably gotten. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a, now that you mention it, I mean, it is. It also works better if you understand the tropes that it's referencing mm-hmm. and, yeah. and the stuff that it's playing with. Yeah. And again, it plays like gangbusters in a theater. Absolutely. Yeah. And the person that made it like loves horror movies. Like Jordan Peele loves horror movies. Yeah, and, yeah. And and you can feel that, and that's why I enjoyed it because I was like, he knows what he's talking about. Like you can tell, you know, Rosemary's Baby is a movie that he loves. Night of the Living Dead is a movie that he loves, and you can see it. I mean, he's less overt with the references. I feel like. Um, yeah, they're baked in in a different way. Right? Yes. They're in the windows. They're in the design of everything. Yeah. So I mean, maybe with Get Out, being such a hit. Maybe we'll get some more fun stuff like that that's imaginative and is um, modern. Mm Because that's what that Mm -hmm. is. That's like a modern take. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to reinvent stuff. Like, that's why people don't do it all the time. (laughs) You know? Like, Scream reinvented the the slasher genre. So, you know, it... And it took, you know, like, 15 years to get there. So... Now, 20 years later, we can respect it and still see, oh, look, it's another Halloween movie coming. Let's see which direction they take that in. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, it's it's not easy to make things new when everything's been done. Yeah, so <laughs> you know, true. so yeah, it's it sucks because like as consumers, like we want new stuff, but it's it's hard to make. So yeah, well, that does kind of bring me to the to the closer of the of the episode, which is that you know, is there anything from Scream? Maybe not in your podcast, but but um, Emily, you you've made a short film now. Is there anything that you you guys take or have? appropriated or used or absorbed into your own creative DNA? Absolutely. The short film I'm making is a horror film and it's all girls and it's set in 1996. Okay. So. Well, <laughs> so, um, and I literally rewatched the opening of this to really get a sense because we were saying like, that's a perfect little short film. And I think like our movie is set inside a house. It's a, it's a little horror story, um, that is totally inside a house and, and it is more supernatural than this is. But um, I just wanted to see, like, how you can make something so tight and so scary and that you care for this character even though you've just met her. And and so I I really looked at that very closely. Um, And even, like, it's so weird, but, like, production design, like, couches, all those type of things. Like, I really looked at Scream because it was, like, the perfect example of that time period for me. Um, And also, this movie just, like, is a perfect balance between fun and scary. And I think, like, that's that's what I'm about and that's the kind of thing that I want to make. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And even like I was watching the closing credits, you know, when they like do that, like picture of the person and the, and the text beside it. And I was like, I texted my partner, Josh, um, that I'm working on the film with, uh, he's my co-director and writer. And I was like, we should do this. (laughs) And and we've like this, like floating heads. We've been thinking about it for the poster. Cause we're like, we want to like evoke that time period. Like it's just, um, it's so in, in our DNA, like that particular period of horror movies so it's absolutely influenced me and actually my phone case is drew barrymore where did it go well i'll show you but i have drew barrymore on my phone case so like it's part of me i, I don't think i can remove it from me at all mm-hmm. nor should you no. really i mean honestly and and danita anything from you Does well work into the comedy because <laughs> it, is, it is funny. I mean, it's, it's yeah, a it's good definitely funny. To subvert expectations. And yeah, and I laughs. think like I I have a hard time with like horror and comedy because usually usually I'm not into it. Like because Joss Whedon does it. Like Cabin <laughs> in the Woods. I just like I I on such a visceral level hated that movie. Okay. Um, but so this is this is a movie that really like just like exemplifies the horror comedy genre for me. 
Um, but I would say just like, like Emily, like this movie is just like a part of me. And like what I take out of this movie is like a celebration of movies, um, which I love. And I think like when I was watching it, um, and you know, I'm, I'm quite past my teenage years, but so much about my teenage years, like was discovering movies and that's all I did. And I think like now, now that I'm like approaching 30, I'm always like chasing that high, (laughs) of discovering new things because you don't get it as much as you get older because you just, like, naturally, like, see more things. Sure. So there's less for you to discover. Um, so kind of, you know, when they're, like, in the... hanging out in the house and, like, you know, watching old movies. Like, that's what I did and that's what I still love doing. Um, so I think, I think for me, this movie is just about, like, the celebration of movies, which is, like, what our podcast is about. Um, and I think, like, women in horror is such a, like, rich topic because movies, you know, the classic horror movies, like, weren't made for us, you know? They yeah. weren't made for us in mind, so it's really interesting to go back and kind of, like, pick things out of them to relate to, to appreciate. Um, so, yeah, I think women in horror is definitely, like, a topic we're gonna get into a lot once we get into our podcast more. So. Yeah. I can't wait for the Nev Campbell episode. Oh. We definitely... I want to do... <laughs> I want to do Drowning Mona. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Trust me, Norm. It's been... It's good. No. It is weird and dark and funny. I remember the weird part. It's weird. It's weird. She loves Bette Midler. I love Bette Midler, so, so I have, like... So I kind of went in, I think, like, really optimistic about it. Um, but then I, like, rewatched it. Uh, and it's just like so dark and weird. So, and that's something I appreciate in a movie. So, anyway, so but I don't, I don't know if Emily will agree we'll talk to do about Drowning it. Mona. But the whole thing with our podcast is like we want to talk about stuff that we both really enjoy. So, yeah, I mean that is the challenge of it. But yeah. so far, like we're a lot on the same page. And three episodes in, we're on the same. We're page. on the same page so far. <laughs> but that we're bringing guests and stuff too, which they'll bring films that they love, which I think, um. I'm just, we're doing a horror episode coming up. Right. Probably at the end of the month. Yeah. It'll be coming out. Um, so, and it deals with uh, one of my favorite final girls. I've already talked about her today. So that's a hint for you guys. <laughs> that's true. Right. Well, that's a great out. We'll yeah. with that. Amazing. My thanks to Danita Steinberg and Emily Gagne, whose brand new podcast, We Really Like Her, is available everywhere you get podcasts. It's a fun show. Subscribe today and get the new episode tomorrow. You can find Danita on Twitter at Danita Steinberg and Emily at Emily Gagne, all one word in both cases. And you can find Scream on Blu-ray from Lionsgate Home Entertainment in the U.S. and E1 Alliance in Canada. It's also available on iTunes and Google Play. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you feel like leaving a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever, it would be greatly appreciated. Every little bit helps, it truly does. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening.